Hi, my name is Jay Sugarman, and I want to welcome you to Innovation Showcase. The main purpose of this ongoing series is to inform viewers about exciting innovations and creative individuals across the fields of business, science, technology, education, and the arts. Today via Zoom, we're fortunate to have as our guests, Dr. Sean Wu Lu, Lisa Wee, and Kylie Lu Gormley. Sean is an emergency medicine physician at Massachusetts General Hospital and an associate professor at Harvard Medical School. Based in Singapore, Lisa is a highly accomplished author and illustrator, and Kylie is a fifth grade student at the Runkle School in Brookline. They're here today to inform us about their recently published book entitled, Masked Hero, How Wu Lin Tao Invented the Mask That Ended an Epidemic. In addition to being mother and daughter, Sean and Kylie are the authors of the book, and Lisa contributed the outstanding illustration. This engaging, informative, and inspiring children's book tells the story of how Sean's great-grandfather, Dr. Wulenta, and created the first version of the N95 mask and how this invention helped subdue the 1910 Manchurian plague. During the program, we'll find out why and how the book came about, and in the process, come to better understand and appreciate Dr. Wulenta and his extraordinary contributions to the fields of medicine and public health. Welcome. So delighted you're all able to be here today. And first of all, congratulations on the outstanding book. I learned so much, eager to find out more and have you inform viewers. Um, to that end, let's jump right in. And Sean and Kylie, would you please start just sharing the beginning of the story, why and how the book came about, initial inspiration, motivation, please? Yeah, thank you. And what an honor. We're so um, delighted to be here. Um, so thank you to Innovation Showcase and to, and to you, Jay Sugarman, um, for highlighting this, this, this book and this project. You want to start, Kelly? Okay. So when school shut down, my mom put me on this online writing class. And one of my assignments was to write a nonfiction story. So that's what we did. We need a little paragraph and then um my mom and I noticed that there was not a lot of uh, books about Asian heroes so basically she said Kylie we're gonna do this we're gonna write a book and then we wrote a book <laughs> yes <laughs> oh god <laughs> basically that is the, the that is how this all started it's um I <laughs> Uh, as an emergency medicine physician, and, and you know, as we all know, in March and April of 2020, um, you know, COVID had had obviously been in Asia beforehand, but in, in the United States, in March and in April, you know, we had our first surges, and there was a lot of debate in America about you know who should be wearing masks and when should we wear them. And granted, nobody had really experienced this before, but personally, as a person on the front line, I was frustrated because. It took a while for us even to decide that we were going to wear masks as physicians. And I said, well, <laughs> we can look to the East because they have months of experience and they pivoted back that to wearing masks. So first was like the frustration over the mask debate. And I think second, it was about all of the anti-Asian hate crimes that were happening in the U.S. and um, things like Kung flu <laughs> and China virus. Um and it, it was, and there were so many crimes that were happening to people just because they were Asian that I felt, I felt like we had to do something because I wanted my children and I wanted um, them to be proud of, of who they were and, and where they came from. And I felt like this was something that I could do. Uh, I didn't go to rallies just because I was afraid of COVID, but this felt like I can, I may not be able to change the minds of older people or, or as far as like adults, but hopefully I can change the minds of, we can change the minds of younger people like kids to have just an array of people that represent heroes because we just noticed, you know, we read a lot um, because COVID, you know, shut down all activities. And we just noticed mm -hmm. that just not that many people that were uh, Asians or East Asians that were featured and certainly not that many that were featured as heroes. 
Um, so Most definitely, you know, in addition to those important topics that you mentioned and the timeliness of everything, such an extraordinary individual to be sharing. Mm -hmm. And before Definitely. we hear much more about the book, would you please just share a little bit about your great grandfather and what you hope to accomplish with the book and the story that you told? Yeah, so, so briefly, he was born in Malaysia in the city of Penang. It was Malaya at that time. And uh, he had 10 brothers and sisters and essentially worked really hard because he wanted to be a doctor and got a scholarship or won a scholarship to go to England and ends up being the first Malayan and first person of Chinese descent to earn a medical degree from the University of Cambridge and did a lot of training in various labs all over Europe and then ultimately goes back to Malaysia and then re gets um, recruited to uh, China to, to work in medical education and then ultimately to Northern China where they had this mysterious outbreak. And uh, he essentially designs the, the forerunner of the N95 mask and really institutes why people wear masks in epidemics. So why we wear masks today really stems from all of the work that he did a century ago and uh, ends up getting doing the first autopsy and finding out that it's spread through respiratory droplets rather than through uh, rats as a vector. And that's that's how he, he ends up doing a lot of other things to control the epidemic, <laughs> but um, but largely he's famous for the Wu mask and, um, and how to control pandemic or epidemics. As you say, much more to the story, which is very inspiring. Um, Getting back to thinking of writing the book, once you came up with the idea, a little bit about the process that was involved in starting and then eventually uh, creating the whole story in the book format. What was that like? Collaboration with others? A little bit, please. Oh, yeah, thanks. So as Kylie had mentioned, I think when we when we decided, you know, when we this this largely was um you can see it but her um <laughs> the type of the whole book <laughs> you know as as a as you know jay is a elementary school teacher like they they have these assignments with like illustrations and um and then the the area at the bottom where they write and this really ended up being the the forerunner of our book which it was four pages and basically we had done a little bit of research beforehand just for her to be able to write those um the, the outline of the book, but that essentially was what we did. <laughs> and I just had expanded it. Uh, so it really did start out as her assignment. Um, and uh, Dr. Dr. Wu um, had published an autobiography about, about a year before he died, which was uh, really fortuitous, not that he passed away, but that he actually was able to publish this right before he passed away. And it basically is um, you know, the outline of, of everything in, that he had done in great detail. And so we were very fortunate that that we had this in great detail about like the plague and what he did and how he felt. And then we had to see what else was out there as far as um, corroborating evidence about what, what had happened. And I actually had um, emailed um, some experts in, um, you know, from across uh, the world that had done work um, studying his, his things. So um, Christos Linteris is a medical anthropologist um, at the University of St. Andrews. We actually did go visit him one time <laughs> um, just to get his opinion about like, what can I actually say or what do you, what's your opinion? So so largely our source was um, this book as well as what was written about him in, um, you know, that we could get research on um, on the internet and then some personal dialogue with um, with family members who also knew him and, and these experts um, out there. Terrific, terrific. Well, Lisa, welcome. And would you Hi. start by sharing how did you become involved with the book and the collaboration? Actually, it's supposed to be started as a self-published project. And then I was approached by Dr. Shan about the book. So I was really very excited because this is the first time I ever heard of Dr. Wu. Shame on me. I'm a I'm born and bred in Malaysia and in the same town as uh, Dr. Wu, actually. Oh. So, and I literally walk the same street as he does <laughs> anyway, when he was, when he was, um, you know, in that actual city itself. Yeah. Wow. So when I came in, 
um, I knew that I had to do, I had to go back in time, which is in the 1875 when he was born, right up to 1910. And those period of time, um, it actually ranges a huge changes in terms of education, in terms of medical sciences and stuff like that uh, occurring in Southeast Asia and everywhere else in the world. So he started in the Victorian era, ended up uh, in the 1910 with the Edwardian era. So I had to look into all the different announces uh, of changes in terms of fashion, in terms of hairstyle, in terms of um, the structure of the building as well. And on top of it, um, I had to go back into the multicultural society, which he was born into, go and then go into England, which is really quite monocultural at that time, and then goes into uh, European countries. So those changes makes me um, really happy to receive that kind of material on my hand. Great. You know, we're very fortunate that you've provided us with these collages of images that show your research and how that informed your illustrations. Really fascinating yeah. and shows the incredible background work, not to mention the artistic uh, contributions that you made. Just a quick word. Um, as we go through some of these and feel free, Sean and Kylie to add, um, what are we seeing here, Elisa? So at the bottom there, um, it's a street, it's one of the oldest streets in Penang. So you can, you can notice the multicultural nature of the streets. Um, there's a mosque at the back, but uh, in the illustration, I've actually uh, added a, a Chinese temple because um, a lot of the Muslims and Chinese and Indian actually congregated in that area um, the first period of migration. So um, wait, what you are seeing is a real scene where you see a multicultural uh, society emerging from a very early stage of Penang. And um, I really was very fascinated because um, the bustling of what I felt Penang was is, um, is infused in all the vendors, the street food and all the, the things that are all the vibrant colors that you see on, onto the uh, illustrations. So I wanted to place in um, Chinese Indians and also give homage to, to the Malays who is living down there, who has actually hosted us for a very long time. So that is the scene that I came out with. And the scene at the uh, with the home environment, I wanted to depict where the kitchen is really the central part of most of the homes. Um, in the olden days, we don't spend a lot of time in the bedroom, not like in right now, where there is a lot of individuals having their own beds. But in, in the olden days, the kitchen is where everyone comes in, whether you're sitting there or whether you're just wanting to chill. Kitchen is where the heart is. So I wanted to keep where the whole family structure coming back together, uh, where the 10 siblings and the mom and the dad coming together to have a meal. Fascinating. And, no, yeah. it's just fascinating to hear the research and your thinking behind the illustrations and putting it in the context that you've drawn up for us. Let's move yes. on to another one. And a, a quick word about this. Uh, Please. Okay, so uh, we were debating about the shipping boat, okay, um, that takes him from Malaysia, which is Penang, to England at that time, whether there's two, two steamers or one steam. So I had to go and research into uh, the migrations from of England, of British, um, to Australia. So I went and researched into all of it. And these are some of the images that I actually picked up. And uh, the first picture is a picture of the actual scene of Penang with all the small little sampan. So sampan is those wooden uh, boats that you, was, uh, you see along the shores of Penang at that time. And then the last picture is when all the coolies, the coolies are the workers that actually 
post all the rice and all the uh, traits that goes on to the uh, at that part. This is the part where all the shippings and tradings goes on nearer to where the part of uh, where the ferries are. So I was really uh, very much amazed. So I placed in a lot more of the um the at that point Penang was colonized by the British. So majority of the people waving goodbye will be the British, and only one couple which is standing on the on the far left, that's when you will see the mom and dad waving, not waving, because most Asians are not very expressive. So mm -hmm. they are staying down there watching their son going off to England. Nice, nice. Sean and Kylie, what was it like, your involvement with the collaboration with Lisa and just your thoughts on what she was able to add and enhance the book and the story? Yeah, well, we were so fortunate to be able to find someone who's from the area, from Malaysia and Singapore. I mean, how amazing is that? And so I, I the story goes back to Tanya Paris, who was Kylie's kindergarten teacher at Runkle. And I went to her and I said, I I, I want to write this book. I don't know where to start. I'm a, I'm a physician in the daytime and I really want to share this story. I don't, but she was so inspiring. She said, you know, you have to do this. And so she, she um, led me to this whole community on Readsy to like find um, editors and illustrators because I ha we had originally wanted to just get it out there as fast as possible with the hope that maybe we can stop <laughs> COVID, you know, maybe not in four months, but like if kids will wear masks and we give them hope and we all are in this together and we all wear masks, we could have stopped it early on. Um, the long and short of it was that it ended up, um, we were about to publish it and then an edit, uh, a uh, agent decided um, because uh, about a year, about a couple months later, um, Google made Ulienda a, a Google Doodle. Mm -hmm. And I think after that, he the agent said, oh, this actually has an audience. So he, he took on the story. But in general, <laughs> if you want to traditionally published you you end up not yeah. <laughs> you submit originally to the agents and not and you don't get illustrated so I did everything backwards and wrong <laughs> but, but this is how the journey it worked out yeah. yes how the journey unfolded because that was sort of how we wanted we wanted to publish this during the pandemic mm -hmm. um, the height of the pandemic and then through all sorts of you know, uh, journeys and ups and downs, it ended up being um, how, it, how it unfolded. Because typically, as, as I guess Lisa knows, right, you typically don't send uh, the illustrations to the publisher because the publisher has their own um, illustrator. Um, but it, it was wow. fascinating. So Kylie, when we were looking at illustrators, um, basically ended up wanting to pick Lisa because we loved, <laughs> right, we loved her work. Oh, yeah. And um and Kylie also, when she was in kindergarten, wanted to be a, a children's book illustrator and author. And so, um, and she's, she always tells me when, as a, from the kid perspective, <laughs> what will work with children, because it's been a long time since I've been a kid. <laughs> so she tells me what will appeal to children. Well, it all came together incredibly well. Before we hear each of your thoughts a little bit more about the book and the process, Lisa, just a quick word on your illustrating. Um, how do you go from an initial idea to say finished product that we see in front of us? Usually uh, a project will probably takes about three months to six months because it requires me to actually get into the hate space of, of that era and of that time. Um, there's a lot of research goes into just coming out with something what you see in front of you. So I would immerse myself with a lot of information from the uh, from different perspectives. So I will go down to the National Library and I really was very grateful because they just had a nice exhibition about Dr. Wu right before I got my manu the manuscript and I managed to actually have that glimpse or what it looks like at that time. So I was really very amazed. And then when um, Candlewick art director says that we needed to get a real tri into the picture, the first page. And I thought to museum myself, uh, that's when I'm gonna go to the National Library and take a, a photograph of a real life 
uh, trishaw that is available in front of me. So I spent a lot of time sketching, a lot of time uh, renewing inside my head before I actually goes into sketching out uh, the illustrations. Then um, after that, I will go through the manuscript uh, word by word, word by word, and I will read it for actually for weeks before I would even wanted to commit to a scene that I um to a scene so that I would depict the the right emotions that goes along with the words because sometimes words can be quite factual. So what I wanted to put in is a visual of the emotions that mm -hmm. the person is going through, and I think it's really very important for kids to actually find that we can have um, all books. I mean, a book, a picture book doesn't have to have all the happy uh, faces. It just has to have a range of emotions because this is what real life is about. And I also want them to invite kids to come into the pictures and feel they are together with with the character and identify themselves with that character. Well, you so definitely me, accomplish that. Um, like to hear in the time we have left first, uh, one or two things looking back that each of you learned or maybe surprised you about Dr. Wu, the situation after the process of writing the book. Kylie, would you share something that really stood out to you that maybe you didn't know even after you wrote your initial uh, report? Mm, well, before we wrote the book, I knew that uh, um. Linda invented the mask, but I didn't know he was having an epidemic. So that was cool for me to learn. That's all. Incredible, incredible. Sean, I know you had been familiar with your great grandfather, but anything uh, surprised you from all the work you put into it? So the, the, and as Lisa said, Asians are not that emotional, but there was this one part in the book. <laughs> You know how scared he is right and mm -hmm. basically you know you go through this book and it's very um it, it, it is very factual but there is this one area where he says uh this is sort of how he deals with it and it's um uh and it was a probably the only, the only part where i hear like wow it, you know it's pretty it, it, it was very frightening to be up there there's no there there's no cure um, and you have to invent something to stop the spread of it, even though you're in the midst of taking patient care of patients um, who could, you know, essentially get you sick and ultimately lead to your death. Um, so I thought that was great just to know that even though I was going through COVID and scared, even though most people do fine with COVID, um, to just connect with him, even though, you know, it's been a century since, you know, he did his work, um, just to feel that bond, like, oh, of course he was scared, right? So that was great yeah. for me. Nice. And Lisa, just briefly, one thing that stands out that you took away from your contribution. Um, I was amazed that when he came back to Malaya, he couldn't get a job because he was a British physician. And here was a person who was actually one of the most qualified person to be a doctor in Malaya. And the other thing is that... Um, how he actually stood up. I mean, he didn't take that situation in a negative way and he actually did something more than that. Actually, he actually promoted uh, children's um, girls' education, which is really not a very strong thing uh, during that time. Uh, he actually uh, educated the public about the loyalty where they actually had, uh, you know, those long hair. Um, so he taught men uh, that you actually are free not to be loyal to your old past. And I was really very amazed about that. And there was one time um, they were talking about how he is a person who doesn't speak uh, Mandarin or the local dialect in, in China and that he was discriminated uh, even by the Chinese people because he doesn't speak Chinese. So in that way, um, discrimination doesn't just come from outsiders, but sometimes it comes from within our own community as well. So that really amazes me. Mm -hmm. Very interesting to hear. Sean and uh, Kylie, in closing and just thinking about the book, what message or impact do you hope it has with readers? Mm -hmm. 
Um. Oh, heroes need determination, hard work, kindness, and kindness. Heroes stand up for what they believe and never lose hope. <laughs> yes. Fabulous. Um, and we do want to spread the message that heroes come in all sizes and genders and races, and that everyone has a superpower that they can use to help others. Nice, nice. Do you have any upcoming plans, extensions, either with the book or what's going on beyond the publication now? So we do have a couple more events, one uh, book readings, um, both here in or one in Winchester and one in um, San Francisco. And then we've been talking just talking to various people and friends um, about whether or not the next step might be a play, like a children's play. Mm -hmm. Um, and maybe even something on streaming, you know, something where it could be on television somehow. So oh, as that far goes. as like, you know, some kind of um, Netflix or, or something like oh, that. Something. Oh, for sure. For sure. <laughs> it's an incredible story. Um, just uh, share a little bit. What's been so far the reaction and feedback uh, everybody's gotten from the book? That's it. So feedback? Feedback. Um. What have people been saying to you or you've been reading about or hearing? Uh, it, okay. Yes, they like the book. <laughs> they say it's very unique and oh, that's, yeah. yeah. And, I, mean, I have to say, like uh, Lisa mentioned earlier in the program, I wasn't familiar with Dr. Wu, so learned an incredible amount and definitely motivated me to want to read much more, um, not as quest quite as much research as Lisa's put into the book, but <laughs> definitely uh, interested to learn more because just an amazing individual, a true person who I might refer to as a change seeker or change maker and the perseverance uh, that he put into the incredible accomplishments um, and the impact that his work had both then and to this day is just outstanding. So like many good children's books, um, people of all ages can learn a lot um, from reading and enjoying this type of literature. So again, congratulations on fantastic effort in informing so many of us about uh, Dr. Wu. Yeah, thank you. Thank so you, Kaylee. Thank yeah. you, Kaylee, for doing the project. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well done. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Fabulous. Well, unfortunately, we've come to the end of our time. I want to thank all of you for being here, for sharing the book, sharing the story, and continued success with upcoming endeavors. Thank you so much. It's been such an honor, and 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 thank you for all the work that you're doing, both of you. Really incredible um, inspiration to both to all of us. Appreciate that. Um, also, want to thank those. Us. Yeah. Thank those of you watching, and hope you be able to tune in next time.